Subtle in class, time for the oldest magic of them all. At least I assume we learned how to mix bud lines before potions. Sorcerers are unique in that they don't use magic, they are magic. I was arguing these should be counted as magical beasts back when that category existed, because this is monster magic. It's true divinity, nature's wrath. You aren't learning how to bend the laws of reality on a whim, you're a natural anomaly learning about yourself. Improvement in your magic is self-improvement and actualization, personal growth. And let's get the stereotype out of the way right now. You're not just a magical nepo baby being born with something that everyone else had to work for. You're someone who suddenly started bursting everything you love into flames and had to work equally hard not to constantly kill everyone you love. If anyone's privileged here, it's the person dropping 50 gold per spell level of each spell, plus the tuition that got you there. If anyone's got it easy, it's the one who can casually drop the price of a house to learn Snimlock Snowball Swarm, which is a fun spell, but some of us can't afford a mortgage. But sorry, I'm not even a sorcerer. I'm an artificer. I just hate that stereotype. It's still a skill they worked hard to hone, like drawing or writing or singing. A natural inclination doesn't make it any less effort, and at least learning magic was a choice for you. But before we dive into the eight types of bloodline you can refine into power, let's look at their similarities. You ready? Then let's go to the like and sub button. You know you'll forget if you don't do it now. Anyway, first off, magic. You can cast spells a certain amount of times per day from the ones you know. It's the easiest one to keep track of, no choosing from your whole spell list every day. You know X, you cast Y times. Easy. You also have by far the most cantrips. Weak but free spells you can cast infinitely. Most casters who even get them learn two to eventually four, but you learn four to six. You also have the second highest amount of spell options at 223 choices. But here's the elephant in the room. You're tied for the full caster with the least amount of spells known, a problem large enough that all the later subclasses try to patch it. Furthermore, all but seven of your options are shared by the wizard, and the sorcerer's only exclusive spell, Chaos Bolt, came as part of an expansion. They were originally the only spellcaster without exclusive spells. Shout out to Waterwalk and Daylight, which, wait, Amelia's not here, right? Shout out for being exclusive to basically everyone other than the wizard, because they involve being cool and seeing the light of day. The wizard sorcerer befriends deep and I am all for inciting more drama. Being a magical creature does give you perks to magic, primarily getting to mess with it. You gain a special power called sorcery points, basically an internal pool of raw magic. You can use them to cast more spells or activate your class powers. You sacrifice spell slots for more and they restore daily on your long rest, so at 20 some will come back on the short. Tasha lets you use them to reroll failed saves at level 5, but the primary use comes with meta magic. At level 3, 10, and 17 you get options to modify your spells. Spend that power to protect a friend in the middle of your fireball, do more damage, work as a bonus action, cast without words or movement, double the range. For some, you can even try double casting, extending the duration, or forcing disadvantage on the same. Tasha's even lets you reroll a spell attack or change your damage type. You also have proficiency with charisma, your casting stat, and constitution, which makes it so much easier to keep your concentration spells. So while others might know all of your spells, no one can cast them quite like you. Not even other sorcerers, because different bloodlines tend to pick up different spells to complement the benefits of their powers. At least that's how it worked on Naruto. At levels 1, 1, 6, 14, and 18, those powers manifest in a wild spectrum of magical variety bursting with possibilities, just like the exact opposite of the Clockwork Soul. Oh come on, that was too good of a setup to not subvert. The Clockwork Soul is one of the newest ones, and it's not chronomancy like you might expect. It's order, law, everything working as smooth as clockwork. To this end, you get up to 10 extra spells prepared. Protection, restoration, dispelling, things to set the world straight and guard against anomalies. And even better, you can swap those spells for other abjuration and transmutation spells. Even steal from the Warlock and Wizard because Dasha's options are just cracked. Anyway, also at level 1, you can remove advantage or disadvantage from someone a few times a day, bring everything back to an even playing field. At 6 you can create a ward to prevent damage, at 14 you can enter a minute long trance preventing advantage against you and treating low rolls as a 10, and at 18 you basically just revert everything within 30 feet to how it used to be. Wipe away spell effects, fix anything broken, and 100 points of healing to spend however you want. Those last two are once a day but were chargeable with sorcery points. The general idea is just preventing change, HP change, dice change, the world's running fine and people need to stop changing things. Now this one's probably the weakest thematic but it's trying to invoke the clockwork plane of pure neutral law, Mechanis. And don't get me wrong, this one can work great if you want to take it in that clockworky steampunk direction, be a warforged and go wild, or tweak it into a robot direction. But prevention and wards and restoration of the norm is something we can work with. Be the magical crime scene cleanup, covering up things that would scare the populace. Maybe you're working for a guild or a crime family sent out to prevent and revert damage that could trace things back to them. Or maybe you're just a freelancer removing Fey or anything outside of our plane. Go pull SCP or Warehouse 13 and make your character around capturing artifacts and creatures. You can go full into law and order, or just natural law. You're a science teacher sick of people stomping on laws of physics, trying to restore the world to its proper form. On that note, you could go full Call of Cthulhu and be an aberration investigator. Anyway, let's smash that clock and set up our dichotomy with the one, the only, wild magic. Known by all, loved and hated. When I say sorcerer, you're probably thinking of this. Wild magic is one of the originals and deals with randomness. You get advantage on a roll once per day, and at six you can use sorcery points to apply penalties to others' rolls. But what we're here for is the wild magic surge. When 
whenever you cast magic, the DM can tell you to roll a d20. If you roll a 1, you can use this amazing chart. Cast extra spells, become invincible, change size, talk by screaming, turn into a plant, all sorts of things. Yeah, there's a few negative ones on there, but it heavily favors the good and neutral. At level 14, you can even roll twice and choose the result. Level 18 sidetracks a bit by letting you re-roll spell damage dice that roll maximum damage, but it does let your damage explode with some luck. And luck's the name of the game for this one. This is the sorcerer of gamblers, Pickle Fay, and Fate Twisters. You can lean into it or be oblivious. This is just how magic works. But whether this is by chance or a gift or it's you struggling for control, we need to talk about the system. First of all, that level 6 ability is just a guidance cantrip as a reaction. There is no reason it should be two sorcery points or anything. Just make it proficiency times a day. More importantly though, those surges need a tweak because I love them. They're so close to being great, but they're really not there. Personally, my system is to roll a d20 and add the spell level. 20 or more, you wild magic. It's the inverse of the current system because wild magic is a good thing. It's why we chose the class. There's other systems too, like rolling your spell save DC as a charisma check or keeping it at one but using different dice for different levels. Maybe keep it simple and use the spell level as the DC, but I highly recommend a change. Having your main mechanic be DM only is just not good. It's bad for the DM having yet another thing to track and it feels horrible when you can't even try for it. I can't even remember inspiration. You think I'm going to remember your surge at the busiest time of the game? And even then, it's only a 1 in 20. You'll go entire sessions before seeing your main mechanic. No, you chose a wild magic sorcerer for the chaos, so let them try chaos. Either have them roll every time or let the player choose. I also recommend using or even making an expanded chart. There's plenty around. I made my own with some personal ideas and some stolen ones. One of my favorites is you and the strongest creature within a mile are momentarily aware of each other. It happened to a wild sorceress I know while she was preparing to leave Waterdeep. Discounting the ones who would definitely be guarding against it, she got Xanathar. Suddenly got a panic message later to not come back to the city. Apparently the thieves guild were going on a rampage against every magic user in the city for unknown reasons. <laughs> Hilarious. I'm actually named after her youngest daughter. That's not a joke. It's not my first name, but it is actually true. That barbarian example I show sometimes is another one of her daughters. But enough about that. What if you want your sorcerer's name associated with a different kind of flawless being? In that case, the divine soul is for you. Once per rest, you can add 2d4 to a missed roll, and you get a free first level bonus spell. It's one out of five options depending on your alignment, but DMs, I am begging you, let them pick any spell. It says you can swap it for another cleric spell, so come on. They've already got most of the spells anyway, let it be thematic. And I really do mean nearly all of them, because Divine also gets the Cleric spell list. That's a level of customization I can't really touch on here, but Clerics have some amazing spells, and you get to add meta magic, heal from farther, twin healing word, make spirit guardians last for hours. You're also just generally great at healing, getting to spend a sorcery point to reroll dice at level 6. You can even do it for an ally's roll, so when you're by their side, everyone heals better. At 14, you can sprout wings whenever you want, and at 18, you can restore or half your health once per day. Choosing spells for this sorcerer is either a dream or a nightmare. They already had the second highest number of spell options at 223, but once you add in almost all the divine spells, they've got the second highest number of spell options at 326. Sorry bud, they're not called the sorcerers of the shore after all. Now as for what to do with these, demigods are a dime a dozen. They're so common in some pantheons, we literally have one on staff, Catherine. She's a bubbly, happy, dumb as nails sorceress. Child of a nature deity, bastard cursed to be Medusa. She doesn't even know that Medusa are fear. Everyone just thinks she's a dryad. If you don't want to go the obvious route, maybe this isn't how you were born. You were a cleric or a druid who bonded with something divine. My wild magic friend could have been divine soul. She was fused with a fey god who lived on through her bloodline. With her being the last one, he fully lived inside her, giving her power to ensure she survived. Maybe you were changed by fallout from an angelic battlefield. You traveled to Mount Celestia in a dream, or made out with an angel in disguise, or ate a celestial being. You could be the result of an experiment to fuse angel and demon energy into one being, like my friends Lucity and Bittery. Come to think of it, I know a lot of magical people. But if your mom knew some of the most magical people, you might be a draconic sorcerer. You could be part dragon, it could be a pact, but either way, your ancestor connected with the dragon and now you get power. You get permanent mage armor and bonus HP in the form of having scales, learn draconic, and get a bonus when talking to dragons of your color. At 60, do more damage with your dragon's type and can get resistance for one hour. At 14, you get dragon wings you can toggle on and off, and at 18, you can make like a dragon and charm or terrify everyone within 60 feet. Real dragons can only terrify, but I guess you're special. Make sure you pick up the dragon's breath spell to complete the look. Triple down as a half dragon, dragon born dragon sorcerer. Now as we all know, I tend to struggle with thinking of new options for the dragon ones. There's not really anything else like them, and you probably pick them up specifically for the dragon. So I suggest spicing things up with your backstory instead of just reflavoring. Where does your power come from? And don't say a one night stand with a bard. My Smasher Past the Monster Manual blog had six out of the top ten as dragons. Everyone likes dragons, it's not weird. Maybe your parent was a powerful barbarian who charmed them with beats of strength, or a paladin whose pure heart impressed their shapeshifted sensei. Plenty of draconic creatures are made from rituals involving their parts or horde. Maybe you're the child of a cultist who absorbed the ambient power of the lair. You could even be the kid of a dragon slayer infused from your mom being drenched in blood while she didn't know 
she was pregnant. Is that draconic taint why you were cast out? I mean, you're probably traveling with mercenaries after all. Maybe your mom was a rare yellow dragon who orphaned you to stay hidden. Or you're from a noble bloodline on a pilgrimage to prove your strength. You might be the youngest, but you can still become the heir if the dragons pick you to reinfuse the bloodline. And again, maybe this isn't something you were born with and you're adventuring as an agent of the master who gave you their blood. Or your parents were blessed by the dragon spirits they act as shrine keepers for. I know that 5e doesn't do long dragons, so maybe go with bronze for the connections to storm and water. Though honestly, your eastern dragons might be better off as storm sorcerers. The storm sorcerer brings the power of the raging sky. You can speak the language of elementals and can fly before or after casting a leveled spell. You don't provoke opportunity attacks either, so it's great for escape. At level 6, if that spelled out thunder or lightning damage, you can also damage whoever you want within 10 feet. It's only half your level in lightning, but AoE damage never hurts. You also get resistance to lightning and thunder and a bunch of cool weather effects. Change the wind direction, make brain not fall on you and your friends. It's probably not useful, but at least it's fun. At 14, if people hit you, they get zapped and thrown 20 feet. And at 18, you're entirely immune to lightning and thunder damage. You can also make the entire party fly once per short rest. That is incredibly good. Where was that the rest of the subclass? I'm half kidding. I care more about flavor than numbers, but especially nowadays, this one's a bit weak. DMs, I recommend that you let them fly with cantrips too. It's only 10 feet. Most characters can jump that far, but it really helps a sorcerer that wants to be in the enemy's base like this one. And they need all the help they can get. They only have a d6 hit die and no armor. And as for you, the player, just remember not to go all in on lightning or you're gonna get walled. At least take the elemental death beat or transmuted spell meta magic. After all, you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? Not much. Most of them resist it. Now as for how you got this power, let's ignore the obvious ones. Not because there's anything wrong with jokes about Zeus, but because you don't need me to tell you them. Maybe you were infused by nature into literally being the storm that is approaching. You're a bad omen incarnate. Might be something silly like having your picnic rained on one too many times, or you survived a hurricane and got infused with power in its eye. Or other storms like monsoons or sandstorms. Maybe you're a cowboy from Tornado Alley. Nobody expects Henry from Nebraska who's watched a hundred twisters. And on that survival front, the thunderbolt and lightning might be from your job. Fixing power lines or clockwork creatures, sailing, even mail delivery. I mean hell, I almost got struck by lightning while screaming soliloquy at a storm in my jammies. A few feet to the left and those oak cleaving thunderbolts would have singed my red head. Sometimes I gotta tell the gods, do it you won't, you coward. Or other creatures like giants or kraken that can give the power directly. And speaking of giants, what about Bahir? Bahir are these electric crocodile dragon centipede things that giants made to hunt dragons. And yeah, you could be part Bahir, but what if you're the newest experiment by an ambitious giant? Bahir aren't working as well anymore, so they made a sexy lightning mage to lure in and slay. How else are you gonna get rid of the friendly ones the humanoids are protecting? Prepare the world for a storm of war, usher in a new age of giants. But first, let's darken the sky even further with the shadow sorcerer. Shadow in D&D usually means undeath, but thankfully it sticks to actual shadows for mechanics. You have double the usual dark vision length, can cast magical darkness and see through it with sorcery points, and you can make a save to drop to 1 HP instead of 0. It's only one success per day, but you can try again later if you fail. And don't underestimate that darkness either. Being able to hit people while they struggle to hit you is good on anyone, but especially a caster. At level 6, you can summon a walking bad omen, a spectral direwolf that can't be hidden from and gives disadvantage on saving throws. At level 14, you can teleport through shadows, a shadow class classic, and at 18, you can spend points to turn into a shadow creature. You're resistant to almost all damage and walk through walls for a minute, like a barbarian's rage, but better. It's honestly a pretty fantastic use of the shadow class theme. And the church grim is a nice touch. But again, why do you have this? I do like sticking with shadow powers, and these can work great as ghost powers, but I'd like to go more esoteric with this one. Maybe you're manifesting a desire to be unseen. It's your own pure and terror manifest with your magic. The wolf basically being your soul and lashing out in panic survival instinct while your body short circuits. You were lost in the woods and the darkness consumed you, but you came back out alive. You were an orphan and only in shadow were you ever truly hidden and safe. But this one, it might not even be a blood power, it's just your clan's hidden technique. Like the magical version of a shadow monk. Be the duplicitous diplomat to their assassin. Trained in the art of killing in plain sight and escaping into the night. Be the sort of person the party is sure will end up as an evil advisor someday or the head of a secret police. But if we're going into mental warfare darkness, probably best to stick with aberrant mind. Because another type of supernatural power you're born with is psionic power. This, of course, comes with telepathy. It only lasts a few minutes, but you can stretch it for a mile and recast it infinitely. Even better is that this came out in Tasha's like Clockwork Soul, which means you get 11 free changeable stolen spells. And at 6, you can even cast them silently without most component costs by spending points. You see why I said Divine Soul should get to steal their spell from whatever is appropriate? Nowadays, this is just how it goes. These are all about telepathy, telekinesis, messing with minds, and tentacles. It's aberration flavor at this one, so Lovecraftian nightmares mostly. Because of that, you're resistant to psychic damage and have advantage against charms and fear. At 14, that can come out as temporary transformations at the cost of sorcery points. Swim and breathe underwater, squeeze through one-inch gaps in restraints, see the invisible with eyes beyond eyes, or fly. And as your final power, you can teleport and leave a mini black hole. Sucks in people within 30 feet and does a bit of force damage. Great for setting up area of effect spells. Now calling this a psionic class is a bit of a stretch to be honest. Psionic things usually let you cast silently by default, you're casting by thinking. You can still do that with your special spells by spending sorcery points, so I guess the magic's just something you do on top of being psychic? Whatever, sounds like this 
this as flavor, so let's change it more. Turn this into fungi, warp and pass information through mycelium networks and spores. Or nature in general, your telepathy is whispers carried on the wind, your tentacles are vines and you grow wings to fly. Maybe everything is psychic and you're just ADHD. You're not saying magic words, you're trying to keep focused by making hand gestures and muttering the thing you're trying to do. Maybe you're haunted or an exorcist who keeps befriending ghosts. Honestly though, most roots involve horror, especially bloodline-wise. It's hard to find something psionic that's not tied to mind flayers. There are a few, like gym dragons and star horrors, but even the exceptions are usually tied to Lovecraft or the Far Realm. So my solution is to go for real terror. Lean into the lol random of years past, peer into the abyss and find nothing but a lawless wasteland of glomps and uwu and I can as cheeseburger. Fill the table with true dread, either cringing at old culture or how long it's been. Forget that though, no more feeling embarrassed about the past. Embrace it and revel in it, make it our strength. Deal your psychic damage with genuine enjoyment of old cringe. Aberrant mind, more like welcome to my twisted mind. Make them go bananas. On the moon! Which is the transition to Lunar Bloodline that like three people will get. Good, if you haven't noticed by now, I communicate through old Flash animations. Anyway, Lunar Bloodline. This is the newest one and I am a huge fan. First, you get Moonfire, which is a free sacred flame cantrip that jumps to an adjacent creature. And speaking of spells, you get 5 to 15 extra spells known, depending on how you count it. You get different sets of spells depending on what lunar phase you're embodying. Bow Moon is defensive and utility magic, New Moon is cursing and offensive magic, and Crescent Moon has utility and offense. This might be one of my favorite abilities ever. I would personally always sync my cycle around the actual moon because it sounds like an amazing thing to work around, but I get that this is better thanks to short time frames or spell jammer or planar travel. But it's not over yet because as we level, this glorious mechanic continues. At level 6, you can reduce the cost of your meta magic a few times per day for spells depending on your moon phase. You can also switch your phase for a sorcery point. You don't have to wait for a rest anymore. And you'll have plenty of those sorcery points because you're not only saving on meta magic, you can cast one of your phase spells for free once a day. And all of that was just level 6 too. Thankfully for my dying voice, the rest are more restrained. At level 14, you either give everyone advantage on investigation and perception by glowing, have advantage on stealth and grant disadvantage on attacks against you while in shadow, or get resistance to necrotic and radiant damage for crescent. Finally, whenever you switch phases, you can blind or heal people with a flash of light, become invisible while dealing necrotic damage and reducing speed to zero, or teleport with a friend while granting both resistance. Every resistance. Where do I even start in this testament to change in power cream? I mean, if you like power, then dear on this tree, but I adore this flavor. I mean, first of all, do I even need to mention where creatures because there are so many stories of shape-shifting under the full moon. You could even play a shifter for extra effect. But beyond that, this works great as a hag bloodline. The moon phases work perfectly for their ancient rituals under different moons. You're an agent of the fates and the alignment of the planets and moon has a profound effect on you. I guess this is a good alternate one if you want to go for a bloodline from space or maybe a lunar deity and again it doesn't have to be an ancestry. You could have been experimented on or the gods chosen or drawn in the beauty of a moonlit night like a druid does the forest. A moon tear dropped on your house or you were imprisoned on the moon via magic. You're a fell omen born during a full eclipse, or you just hate the sun that much. Or the moon. Maybe you worship the stars and praise the new moon hoping it goes the f away already. Maybe your personality changes with the phases, or your body shifts alongside it. Maybe your character loves how it changes, or maybe you only like one phase and get depressed for the rest. Like a sailor or a photographer loving the full moon and mourning when it fades. Or you're just nocturnal like me and adore the night for what it is. I've been forced into a morning shift schedule this year and I have not been happy. But oh well. The sorcerer is a wonderful spellcaster with so many cool tricks under their belt. They have one of the easiest magic systems to follow, but their skill ceiling is super high. Plus, you're basically a magical creature, so much cool flavor you can't get anywhere else. If you do want to go elsewhere though, a few recommendations. Warlock for magic that's easy to track, Bard for staying charismatic with similar but varied magic, and of course the wizard if you just want to go full in on knowing everything. Note however that while sorcerer and warlock are easier ones to learn, full casters are still the hardest classes. You still can as a beginner, but be aware that you have a bit more reading to do up front. Up front like my appreciation for Feral Goblin, Modern Masquerade, and snake oil. Well, I guess it's actually at the end so people don't click off, but you get my meaning. Class dismissed. Fly me to the moon. Let me kick its fucking ass. Let me show it what I learned in my moon jujitsu class. In other words, fuck the moon. In other words, Coward fight me. How's that for a fucking warm up? <laughs>